So we talked about the political dimension of these developments, and now we would like to move on to the discussion about the ethic, ethical dimensions of these new combat systems. And Professor Herfried Münkler is one of the few, or let alone the only theorist of war of the Federal Republic of Germany. He's got the chair of theory of politics at Humboldt University of Berlin, Department of Sociology. But for those who more intensely deal with questions of peace than war, you will be familiar with him and you might have come across him as a person that is very visible in the public who theoretically reflects upon new developments, especially the phenomenon of asymmetrical wars. He published a number of books and articles for which he won numerous awards. So I can announce that this is going to be an intellectual and political challenge. And later on, we're going to have a panel discussion with guests I would like to introduce once they are on the panel. Professor Munkler, you have the floor. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Fuchs, for this kind introduction and the invitation. New combat systems and the ethics of war. I actually focused on this topic, and I'm not going to talk about strategic benefits and advantages. Maybe we will get back to that in the discussion, although I'm very much interested in that. And I would have loved to. In paragraph 328 of his Philosophy of Right, Hegel describes like by way of the invention of the firearm, the personal bravery appears impersonal. Gunpowder and the development of arms that allow to shoot projectiles against the enemy was a step from the concrete to the general and fit, fitted well into the course of history that Hegel called progress. I'm quoting him. The principle of the modern world, this is how he justifies it, and the principle of the modern world is the thought and the universal, has given courage a higher form because its display now seems to be more mechanical. The act not of this particular person, but of a member of a whole. Moreover, it seems to be turned not against single persons, but against a hostile group. Notably enough, Hegel doesn't talk about defense constitution, but the development of war technology as a motor and acceleration factor of integration of the heroic individual into the overall community. So it's about the leveling of the forefront fighters with those in the back rows. The fact that the hoplite's phalanx of the Greek was a precondition for the emergence of democracy is a topos of literature. And only where if every male adult served the community and the polis, we can come up with the idea that these equalized persons are equal in the assembly of the people. But fighting in the phalanx was only possible because of tactical discipline, trust into the person fighting next to one self, and the insistence on everybody appearing as right-handed persons. And it was an intentional and imposed equalization of citizens, whereas weaponry, like gunpowder and firearms, 
do not have and did not have the intended effect of an indifferentiation of the enemy and, as Hegel pointed out, change the ethos of the fighter. And better than the interaction between state constitution and defense constitution, he appreciated a development that was not intended as such, but had its effect behind the backs of the acting persons and against their goals and intentions. Firearms and gunpowder, according to Hegel, were not destroyers of bravery, as the noble knights claimed, but they acted as political levelers and equalizers that enabled the rise of bourgeoisie and accelerated it. These philosophical interpretations of weaponry progress have become something that we are unfamiliar with today. But not only that, we defend ourselves against these interpretations. And as a rule, we invoke ethics to curtail and contain the progress of war technology and its implications. But to get back to Hegel for the last time, the progress of weapon technology was considered to be a motor of pro of a motor for the progress of ethics by Hegel to oppose the ethos of the warrior against technological development to contain it would have meant for him to be conservative and reactionary. We have to bear in mind something in order to gauge the whole problem that I'm going to talk to you about. We don't consider ourselves to be the beneficiaries of developments, but we want to counteract them and oppose them. And to do so, we resort to ethics and law as shackles and ties with which we want to slow down an automatic and threatening development and guide it into a certain direction. This shift, as opposed to Hegel's trust, goes back to the Hague conferences at the end of the 19th century when people tried to ban the use of poison in warfare, something which did not succeed for first for World War II, as you know. And it goes back to 1910 when individuals warned against the militarization of airspace after the brothers Wright, the Wright brothers, enabled their devices to fly. Bertha von Sottner was one of the first that called the consequences of aerial war a barbaric way of waging war. But then World War I displayed the first bomb raids on both sides. Things have outgrown us, as it seems. We're more afraid of them than we appreciate them, so we try to regain control of them again. But the success of that is, of course, modest. So, of course, we could understand the latest armament development as an inversal of the long trend to develop bigger and stronger, more effective weapons. Modern electronics, controllable missiles, and strike drones in particular turned the general enemy back into the specific and concrete enemy that we choose and that we fight in a targeted way. And by way of that, it's become possible to contain the number of those that are hit by an attack without being the target, so the so-called innocent victims. So a lot of things suggest that the scope of collateral damage has been reduced as fighter planes equipped with bombs were replaced by strike drones that can launch missiles in a targeted way. And whenever there are errors and mistakes in this endeavor, this is, as a rule, not due to the inaccuracy or the radius of the weapon systems, but it's due to deficits when it comes to the identification of targets. So it's not technology, but humans that have failed. And as a rule, it's this, this is not because of ethical, but because of cognitive deficits. We could even move one step beyond that and say that intelligence, reconnaissance, and strike drones are systems that 
are aimed at minimizing these cognitive deficits because of their technical capabilities by prolonging the time of observing targets and by minimizing the stress of decision making in the assault situation. The chief officer at a distance of hundreds of kilometers from the target can make his drone go for another loop and another loop to make sure that his target really is a group of hostile combatants and not a wedding party. And as he is so remote from the point of action, from the place of operation, he can take his decisions in a reflected way without too much stress. He operates a joystick, yes, but he is not in the situation of a player of war games where all of a sudden new challenges crop up that he needs to address immediately, but technology gives him time to observe and time to make decisions. And it's precisely this aspect that has been scandalized in the recent discussion about the acquisition and the use of strike drones. So the longer observation time and the more relaxed way of taking decisions. So it's the ideals and imaginations of heroic societies that are opposed against the technologies of modern warfare. It's the lack of symmetry in the confrontation of combatants that is put forward, the invisibility and immunity of one side that is not confronting the fight but uses devices and thus acts in a cowardly way. Thus it's Jakob Augstein, the cowardly weapon of the man. And to pinpoint this, it's the ethos of the Western that applies here, where in a symmetrical duel the better man would win. And here, this concept is opposed to the development of modern weaponry, where, but it would be possible to follow Hegel to make a correlation between progress in weaponry and ethical progress. But a traditional ethos of fighting is put forward here that is part of the world of aristocratic knighthood and the narrative of the Western and war movies in a nostalgic form. Gunpowder and gun, guns have already dissolved this ethos. Knighthood oriented to duels disliked any remote weapon, and this is why they treated archers and crossbow ballisters as war criminals and mutilated them. The famous V of the fingers that English longbowmen showed French knights in the Battle of Agincourt was not a victory sign in the beginning and was not a phallic symbol for um, well, as my colleagues from the gender corner sometimes put forward, but it was the demonstration of the finger used to bend a bow and to shoot. And if knights, or when knights got hold of, got hold of these arches, their fingers were cut off of them, so as they could no longer commit these war crimes. This was chivalry. And it was about to sh about showing them that they would become victims of the errors. So this is chivalry and the ethos going along with it. Those who want to impose an ethos of way of war must not be too careful. Those who understand ethics as an end in itself for oneself and who don't see the opposite side have understood nothing about fighting, but at the end the archers imposed themselves not only in this respect and um, gunpowder and firearms made all of this chivalry obsolete but especially where small heroic communities delimited themselves against the wider community and reserved some privileges for them this has become different the uniform has become a sign for the carrier to embody a certain ethos that was not accessible to the rest of society. So m modern Europe did not 
distinguish itself by the development of an advanced war technology, but by the ethos of the warrior. Post-heroic societies like ours should just be careful when talking about the ethics of war because they're playing with fire, literally speaking, especially when they use this ethics in order to ask more of the soldiers than they would ask of themselves. It's this particular ethics that can be a means to constitute a state inside a state. The citizens in, in uniform is thus closer to the strike drone than the soldier of a classic army. And it prefers its use, uh, the use of infantry in hostile territory in order to deal with an enemy. To pinpoint this, when criticizing the drones, what is expressed is the ethics of a pre bourgeois society with heroic ideals in a nostalgic shape. It's a criticism that did not understand itself. But what is the prerequisite of understanding oneself? It's the acceptance that we live in a post-heroic society and that challenges that we're confronted with are asymmetrical ones. So it's not a fight under the conditions of symmetric reciprocity, but it's the reflection upon our vulnerability and its reduction that is the key towards an ethics to create security for a post-heroic society. Let me mention these three buzzwords, post-heroic, asymmetrical, and vulnerable, and outline these briefly. Societies are only post-heroic if the ideas of sacrifice and honors have disappeared from them, and to be more precise, if there's no longer any sacrifice but only a victim. So victims instead of sacrifices means that the victim is not, or that the act is not an act of rescuing, but it's a claim for compensation. The share of the insurance sum in the overall assets of a people is an indicator for the degree of the post-heroic in a society. What is decisive for the transformation of a heroic into a post-heroic society is the decline of demographic reproduction rates and the declining importance of the religious sphere. The first one is the condition of the possibility of the heroic. The second one is the incentive system to act heroically. And as the hero's death follows a different logic as the one of barter trade, what is required is a religious guiding principle or a political religion to be able to claim it at best or to motivate to it. Let us look back onto the two world wars and then we can say that this shift from a heroic to a post-heroic society has been something beneficial and good and something that gives us relief. But post-heroic societies, as they are post-heroic, are extremely vulnerable and can be blackmailed. The problem of the post-heroic is that it doesn't appear everywhere at the same time and didn't impose himself, itself everywhere at the same time. Post-heroic societies are challenged by heroic communities. And, of course, post-heroic societies have supremacy over heroic communities, so that symmetrical confrontation for the heroes is uh, without any prospect of succeeding. They wouldn't stand a chance. So they develop methods of asymmetrical warfare that are characterized by the fact that the strength of the attacked will be turned into their weakness. So the weak gets a better chance, but this chance can only be used by showing willness, willingness to sacrifice oneself in a heroic way. So it is not a coincidence that the suicide bomber became the incarnation of the asymmetrical warfare of our present. It, he or she uses the infrastructure of post-heroic societies, subways, um, planes, high-rise buildings to attack the unstable collective psyche. And this is where post-heroic societies are vulnerable. And this vulnerability can only be 
abolished by collective repression and done away with it. So they would have to become heroic again. But this is what we don't want to do. And we couldn't do it, possibly because we don't have sufficient demographic reproduction. Vulnerability is thus the key notion for the security conceptions of the 21st century. Under the conditions of symmetry, this vulnerability was limited by increased vulnerance. This is my capacity to harm somebody else. And the prerequisite for this symmetrical vulnerance system that we usually refer to as deterrence was the leveling and the equalization of the players. So the emergence of a body politic, a political body that defined vulnerability as a point of attack for vulnerance. So if you want to harm somebody and cause him pain to motivate him to do something, you need to have a body to attack. But this is what's missing in the modern embodiments and carriers of heroic in the age of postmodernism because networks don't create any body politic, but they are invisible and inattackable, and this is why they can't be deterred. And as a matter of principle, they are similar to what a drone is in structural terms. The other way around, it means that drones and robots are tools with which post-heroic societies defend themselves against asymmetrically acting heroic communities. No doubt about the fact that this way of defending oneself requires ethics, but this ethics cannot be the ethics of the heroic societies, as was mixed up often in the discussion, which means when talking about this, we should not use um, notions like bravery or cowardly behavior, because that would bring us into a trap. Weapons are the essence and the nature of the combatant, is what Hegel says, which means that drones and surveillance systems are not only the weapons, but also the nature of post-heroic societies. Thank you.